it seems like we lost touch with the art of waiting. I get it. Waiting just sucks. Waiting is hard. But I think waiting reflects something deeper. Something that I hope we haven't lost. Waiting. Awesome, awesome. Well, welcome back. Uh, must not have scared you too bad. You've made it back for week three of the Advent study. Uh, I, I think my favorite part of this has so far been Tick, who came out and said, you know what, I've been going to church forever how many years, he named, and he said, I've never known what Advent meant. And, and so that, that's very flattering to me. It's very flattering that, that there is something that, that God has given me that, that is edifying to you as a body. And so I just uh, I praise God for working us through this. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be in the book of Hebrews tonight, the book of Hebrews. Uh, we're really only going to look at the first few verses of a particular chapter. And, and we're going to talk tonight about wait without quitting. Has anyone ever quit too early before in their life? I have. You know, we, we, we all suffer from that at some point in our life. At some point in our life, we know the finish line is there. We know the finish line is coming. We know that, that we have got to push through to the end, but when life's pressures get too much for us, all of a sudden we just give up. And so tonight, I want to remind you that Advent tells us that there is a promise that's been made and there is a promise coming. And so this is a terrific way for us to walk into this season and realize that God has given us good and perfect things. And so uh, as we open up, uh, just gonna ask that God just use this somehow to transform us as we walk through this study tonight. So everybody there, if you're in Hebrew, say amen. There we go, all right. Three weeks ago, we began a study on Advent. We opened up, really, by saying that, that, that waiting is hard, and we all admitted that very clearly, and whether or not we want to say it out loud, enough, uh, out loud or not, it takes a lot of resolve to push through and to continue to wait. It takes restraint, personal restraint, and, and, and even gall to go up against this fast food mentality that we live live in today that, that what we want we'll get right now. And so when we tell someone to wait, they become very agitated. And, and probably if I've got a mirror hung up in front of me, it wouldn't be a they, but it would be a me. I don't like to wait. Waiting is hard. And while society is telling us that we should get our best life now, we have to really listen closely to the Spirit. And then by doing that, we learn very clearly that our best life is not now. Our best life is then, and we have to wait for it to arrive. It is hard fact for us to realize our decisions to wait and our decisions to postpone our gratification actually will benefit us later. Then last week, we talked about wading through, uh, that it takes more courage to, to walk those first steps, and, and then you take the steps to, to move towards a promise, and you take them on purpose, and you take them with strength, and you know it's a marathon, but there are so many times when you get in the middle of the race that you want to quit, and we learn that you have to wait through the pain. There's somewhere you're trying to get, and no matter how badly you feel, how stuck in the middle it seems, somehow you have to summon the strength within you. You have to get that forward fortitude up in you, and, and you have to keep going and not give up. You have to wait through. And much to the disappointment of to let today's philosophies and, 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 and in danger of, of all the political incorrectness or correctness, as, as we want to say, God really in this world does not give participation trophies. He doesn't. He doesn't. It's not about starting the race. It's about finishing the race. And so we learned that you have to wait through some things. We've talked this month 
about drowning out these voices that are in our head telling us that we need to stop waiting and we need to push and grab everything we can. And we, we've talked about the voices and the pressures of this world that tell us that we're never going to amount to anything and we're never really going to be anywhere with our promises with God and that our goals are somehow outside of our reach. But tonight... Tonight, this night, I came to tell you that the devil is a liar and the world needs to shut up. It's really, really, I, I think about all the people whispering in our ear and what I would hope you know is the people whispering in our ear are really the friends of the devil and of the world. They're not of God. And whether you realize it or not, they're the people actually keeping you from the promises. You think they're friend, but let me tell you something. Everybody who calls you friend is not your friend. And that's just truth. I came to tell someone that the promises of God are yes and amen. They're forever and ever. And if he made that promise to you, he will keep his side of the bargain. And the only thing that's going to keep you from getting that promise is you. And that's if you quit. I come to remind someone that God is not a man that he should lie, nor is he the son of man that he should repent of what he has said. He is determined to give you what he said. And I came to remind someone that you don't need to quit. You don't need to stop. And you don't need to stop waiting. Just because you're waiting doesn't mean the promises aren't going to come about. I, I, I came here to tell somebody that your promise is right around the corner. Amen? And whether you realize it or not, it may just be out of your reach. It may be out of your focus. But that promise is still there nonetheless. And sometimes, sometimes you have to wait without quitting. Sometimes you have to wait when it's difficult. And sometimes you've got to make up your mind even before the race starts. I will finish this race. And that fortitude is so, so important. So, so here's the question for tonight. It's a, really a simple question. Here it is. What do you do when you can't see your promise any longer? What do you do in your life when you look around and you don't see that promise? You started out knowing that promise. You started out knowing you heard from God, but all of a sudden something has come out of focus, something has come out of reach, and you don't see that promise up there on that horizon driving you anymore. Now, that's real, Right? Because many of us have been rescued from many situations in our life. We've been pulled up by our bootstraps. We've been kicked in the tail end by God himself, and he's put us in the altar. We came in with all this energy. We came in with all this fortitude. We're ready to push all the way through, and somewhere in the mire of life, all of a sudden, the goals that we had, all of a sudden, the, 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 the hopes that we were longing for, all of a sudden, the things that we were striving for just fade in the distance, and all of a sudden, we find out that we lost our way, and then we quit. And the whole time I think God is sitting up there going, can't you just please wait? I've got a promise sitting right around the thing. All you have to do is keep walking. All you have to do is keep moving. All you have to do is keep serving. And God is screaming at the top of his lungs, please don't quit this fight. Please don't quit this fight. What happens when you start the journey? You see the prize, you hear from God, you take your first steps, and somewhere along the way it's all over again. You look up in the finish line that you once saw right in front of your face. It just isn't exactly where you thought it would be at this point in your life. What do you do when all of a sudden you can't see your promise any longer on the horizon? And I think we find an answer in the word. I think we find a very real answer in the word. But oddly enough, what we find in the word is a misinterpretation that us as Americans have had for too, too, too long. Let's find it together. Hebrews 11 Verses one through three, it says this. It, it, you can read along with me, but I highly encourage you to write this down. Memorize this verse. It's gonna help you keep through. I promise this is something you never want to leave your mind. It just says this. Now faith, it's the substance of things hoped for. Look at your neighbor and say, this is what I'm hoping for. Amen. It's the evidence of things not seen. Say, I can't see it. For it, by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds that were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. For the things that are seen were not made of things which are visible. It's this beautiful understanding that if you can see it, it's not faith. Now, somewhere in today's world, we have misconstrued that the only things I can count on in my life are the things that I can see. But truth be known, if you want to really work faith out, faith is about doing it regardless of whether you can see it. And that's a hard truth, and it's a truth that America has long past forgotten. 
Faith in God means that I will choose to serve God whether I see the promise through in this life or not. Faith in God says that I hope, I believe, I know the whole time, and it doesn't matter if I can see it because that's what faith is. Faith means I can't see it, but I'm going to press towards it. It was 1952 when a young woman by the name of Florence Chadwick decided she would swim from California to the Catalina Islands. She had swam in the Olympics. She had swam to and from the English Channel, from England to France and back. She had plenty of training. She had plenty of support. And if she could do that, if she could do all of that in her life, then this little 21-mile swim shouldn't be too bad. She had done tougher areas. She had gone greater distances. She had fought more sharks and jellyfish than it was going to take to swim this distance. And if there was anyone in the world at this time who would be able to knock this out, it was her. It was her. But the problem is when she attempted the swim on one morning, she failed. Florence swam for over 15 hours while America watched her. Her trainer and her mom in a rowboat or in a boat next to her the whole time screaming at her, you're almost there. But you see, every time Florence looked up, every time she pulled her head out of the water, she couldn't see anything. Well, that was except for fog. It was in her way. After 15 hours and 55 minutes, Florence looked up one last time. She scanned the water in front of her. She was very desperate just for a glimpse of her goal. Mentally, she began tiring and listening to those internal voices, and her fight was almost gone. She had swam the English Channel both ways. She had beat every man's record in front of her coming and going, and today she could win yet again but in her eyes, all she saw was fog. And then in the next five minutes, just before 16 hours, Florence gave up. She asked her support boat, lined with her trainer and her mom to pick her up. And folks, she was less than a half a mile from the coastline. Here's the question for you, I guess. How many times have you, have we, given up because our goal was hidden out of temporary blindness? How many times have we let this fog of life and all the noise going on around us bulldoze its way into us and keep us from seeing the finish line? You can't touch fog. You can't reach fog. You can't grab fog. There's really nothing to it, but somehow it blinded her. And somehow it blinds us. It sickens me to death to know that something we can't physically hold in our hand is killing our dreams. It was the only time, in recorded history at least, that Florence Chadwick had ever quit on anything, at least as far as swimming goes. And why did she do it? She told the news reporters it was because she couldn't see her goal. She stopped. So what about you? How many times in your life have you quit too early because you've lost sight of the goal? You've lost sight of the promise. How many times in your life have you settled for second best because you couldn't see what was just around the corner? How many times has the devil gotten victory in your life because you just couldn't wait any longer? and you chose for a fast food answer for a prize that should have come from a marathon run? How many times? It amazes me what we give up. And I think Paul must have had a same sense of this, right? When he wrote to the church in Corinth, he, he, he put, penned this, this very simple verse that just simply says, we walk by faith, not by sight. 
We're supposed to walk because we know something's out there, not because we can see it. It's like he's yelling out of the text itself that God has given you a promise. Don't stop because you can't see it. Don't stop. It's there. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there, amen? Let me say that again. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. If you don't believe me, you can ask my little toe because in the middle of the night, I can promise you there's a bedpost on the end of my bed. I didn't see it, but I promise you it's there. Family, God has given you promises. He has rescued you for a reason. He is pushing you as hard as he can. It's right around the corner, and yet some of you are ready to quit right now. When did we as a culture start depending on what we see instead of what we know? When did we start demanding for proof from God? Too often people come to see me and, and, and they start talking about what, what, that, that God has given them a word and that, that they're all excited and they're, they're on fire. But the first time, the very first time they hit trouble and something like fog, something that's not even there that they can touch blocks their view of that promise and of that goal, all of a sudden they're ready to walk away. And they're sitting and telling me the story and over and over again, I'm just praying, don't give up. If God gave you that promise, he is going to see it through. Just keep walking. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Florence's problem, I believe, wasn't because she couldn't see. I think that's what the symptom of the problem was. I I, I think that's what she thought her problem was. I think Florence's problem is that she lost faith. I think her problem is that she had swam 20 and a half miles and she was a half line, a uh, half mile from the finish line and she didn't have enough faith to push her through. The vast majority of her time, she had her head in the water and she was looking down. It wasn't just about the fog, it was about her faith. It wasn't that she just couldn't see the shoreline, it's that she didn't believe and she had quit believing that the shoreline was even there. What about your promises? Did you know something, say, 10 years ago that God had given you a promise, but today you look back and you say, I don't even know if that promise was real. Family, there are times in your life that the goals God gives us seem to drift out of sight. But the part that you need to know is this. It's very simple. The part you need to know is that just because you can't see those promises of God anymore, doesn't mean they're gone. It just means something's blocking their view. Something in your life is blocking their view. And so we get to this point in Advent where we have to self-examine and ask the question, what's blocking our view? So I've got very, very quickly, very quickly, four simple things that I think sometimes block our view, block our view from the promises. Number one, If you want to open up the promises of God, spend less time on Facebook and more time in the book. If you want to unlock the promises of God, you need to spend less time on Facebook and more time in the book. Somewhere we've gotten around or gotten to the idea that reading the word is just a suggestion, that it's not a command. But that's not accurate at all. Paul told Timothy, he said, study to show yourself approve. A workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's this command that we should study the word. If you're spending more time on Facebook than you are in the book, eventually you need to know that the trash you're reading will begin to fog out the promises you've been given. Let me say that again. Listen real close. If you're spending more time on Facebook than you are in the book, eventually the trash that you're reading will begin to fog out the promises you've been given. Amen? Say amen or oh me, amen? How about this? I'm gonna give a church a simple challenge. For the rest of the year, it's 15 more days, I challenge you to spend at least 
as much time in the Word as you do on Facebook. I challenge you today to spend at least as much time in the Word as you do on Facebook. And reading those stupid press if you love Jesus and share if you want the blessing of God doesn't count as the Word. That's a lifestyle change for some of us. Spend less time on Facebook and more time in Deep Oak. Number two, number two, listen to God more than you listen to your friends. Listen to God more than you're listening to your friends. I got it, we're human. We like to talk to people. That's truth. We're social creatures, God made us that way. That's okay, that's okay. But when your friends are substituting for God, something's wrong. When your friends are substituting for God, that something's wrong. Some of us in our life are listening to our friends, hearing conflicting stories. And let me give you a very simple clue. This is really simple. If what they're saying conflicts with what he's saying, he's not wrong. If what they're saying conflicts with something he's saying, he's not wrong. Here's an idea, very simple, here's an idea. This is perfect for the rest of the year. I'd love to know that you did this. There's a website called 365promises.com, 365promises.com. When you pull it up, it'll give you the promise for that day. I challenge you, I challenge you, very simple. Decide today that you will spend at least 15 minutes every morning with God rather than checking Facebook and calling your friends. And when I say talking with God or meeting with God, I'm not talking about taking your little wish book out and God, here's what I need you to do. But I'm talking about reading his word and listening to what he has to tell you. Because I can promise you what he has to tell you is more important than what you need to tell him. Amen? Amen. Number three. Number one is spend less time on Facebook and more time in D-Book. Number two, listen to God more than you listen to your friends. Number three, stop settling for second best. I have seen more Christians settle for second best than anyone else in the world. If you wanna know what I believe, what I believe the devil is up to in the church today, it is making us settle for second best. I'll do that. Few things are as discouraging to me as seeing good people settle for second best. I can't count the number of people who have stood up in front of me and sworn they've heard from God and made a commitment only to give up the first time something shiny crosses their path. I met people who will compromise their sanity to get involved in the drama of their friends. I've met people who, will, who, who have absolutely given up their sobriety so that they can hang out with more people in other strange company. I, I've met more people who have given up their relationship with God so that they can go party when they want to. I have given up more, I, I've seen more people give up their integrity so that they can have one night stands. May I tell you, all of that is second best and worthless. God has promises for you. If those are going on in your life, stop settling. Stop settling. Jeremiah once wrote this. It's in 33.3. It says, call to me and I will answer you. I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things, that which you do not know. What a promise. The problem is after he shows us that promise, we walk away before those promises are delivered because somebody else shows us something that we decide we like to. Things get tough, and rather than waiting on the promise from God, we settle for poor substitutes. Here's my suggestion. For the rest of the year, 15 days, that's all it is, keep a promise journal. A promise journal. For the next, the rest of this month, write down every promise that you hear from God or you read from God. And don't just say, I'm gonna remember it. Don't just put it in your head. Actually, pin it down on paper. And then take that paper and hang it somewhere in your house, somewhere you'll see every single day. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Here are the promises that God, and you got a new promise, you go write it on there. And then when something crosses your path, 
and you're trying to decide, is, is this that's crossing my path of God or not? Then all you have to do is compare it to the promise up there. Is this relationship of God? Well, probably not if you met her at a bar last night and you're already sleeping together. Hey, that's real, right? That's truth. We're settling for second best. God has so much more for us. Number one, spend less time on Facebook and more time in the book. Number two, listen to God more than you listen to your friends. Number three, stop settling for second best in your life. And number four, stop letting your present circumstances determine your future outcome. Say it again, stop letting your present circumstance determine your future outcome. For some reason, for some reason, we have gotten caught up in the storms of this life. And truth is, many of us haven't seen the shore for days to come. The fog's in our way, the wind's crashing against us, and we're tired of getting wet. We hear people encouraging us, but it just sounds like clanging cymbals behind our head. Listen to me very closely on this one. The same God who rescued you from a burning hell and is reaching out to you to give you great and mighty promises has not forgotten you. He's just saying, push through, don't quit. I know some of you are struggling through mess. And this is a very candid, open message. It's a very candid, open teaching. Some of you are going through some mess. And what I would tell you tonight is, you can't quit. I don't know where you are in this journey, but you can't quit. I know that you have voices in your head that are telling you to give up. I know you have friends that are whispering in your ear, saying it's not worth it. And I know you have life and its pressures pulling on you, trying to tell you that this just isn't for you. But I would remind you, the same God who rescued you one time will do it again. Every time, every time you feel like giving up, it's time to run to the altar. Don't quit. The whole idea of Advent is like this. God made a promise. He's ready to deliver it, but it needs to be in His time, not ours. Thank you so very much for joining us here today at Church in the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusTheRock.org. There you can find out any information on us, look at our latest podcast or our blogs. If you would like to give to our ministries financially, you can easily do so by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen on our website. Have a blessed day.